Our first speaker for, the, uh, for, for today is Dr. Alison Puglio. She's an ecologist, author, and professional environmental photographer with a focus on fungi. Her work spans both northern and southern hemispheres, ensuring two autumns and a double dose of fungi each year. Alison is actively involved in teaching, research, and conservation, and she's conducted over 700 fungus forays and workshops in a dozen countries over the last two decades. Uh, Alison's the author of The Allure of Fungi, co-author of Wild Mushrooming, and her new book on fungi, Underground Lovers, will be published in March uh, 2023. The title of her talk today is Between Sex and Death, A Journey in the Microsphere. So please welcome Alison Puglio. Thank you so much, Martin, and good morning, everybody. What an absolute pleasure it is to be here. I'm absolutely thrilled to be here. And uh, I hope those of you who've been live streaming in the last couple of days, you've seen many interesting, inspiring sessions. And I'm sure over the next two days, there'll be many new insights and hopefully some new collaborations. But most importantly, I hope you have a really, really enjoyable time. I guess in the next two days, there'll be a lot of talks that look very specifically at particular, particular psychedelic plant and fungus species. But I thought I'd start with the wide view, with just giving you a bit of an overview of this amazing kingdom of organisms and why they matter and how we come to get to know them. And my work's pretty analogue in the sense that I'm not working really at the genetic or the molecular level. I'm pretty much there rolling around in the dirt in the forest working at that level with all kinds of people from foragers and forayers traditional owners, rangers, scientists, filmmakers, philosophers, all kinds of people who are also getting to know fungi. So my work is looking at fungi, but also the ethno-mycological aspects as well. But I thought you might be interested why... I haven't actually got the first slide up there. I'll just flick that back. Why I started with this title, Between Sex and Death, a Foray in Fungal Realms, and give you a bit of an idea where this came from. And as, as Martin mentioned, I've been very fortunate in the last two decades to spend the autumn here in the Southern Hemisphere, mostly in Australia, sometimes South America, New Zealand, and then as it gets a bit too cold here, I switch hemispheres and get another autumn in the Northern Hemisphere, mostly in Europe, sometimes in North America as well. And that way I get two opportunities, two autumns, to spend time with the fungi. And what I've noticed is the Europeans take a much more multi-sensory approach to getting to know fungi than we tend to do in Australia. Typically, the English-speaking nations are often referred to as being a little bit mycophobic or fungus-fearing relative to our European friends who tend to be much more mycophilic or fungus-loving, although, of course, there's a whole spectrum. It's not as, there's not a dichotomy like that. And we're seeing here in Australia in the last few years so much more interest in fungi, not just psychedelic fungi, but fungi in all kinds of other contexts. as building materials. And it's interesting, you know, in the last few years, the people who've been coming to my, what were originally fungal ecology workshops, or as most mostly ecologists and field naturalists and foragers who come, I get all these other people now, people who are architects who are using mycelium to build building products. I recently had a clothing designer from Gertrude Street in Melbourne who's making fungal leather. Filmmakers come along, and then I had one woman who came along and she said to me, I said to her, what, what brings you along here today? She said, I'm a crime fiction writer. And she looked at this big table of mushrooms and she said, can you tell me which one of these will cure a philandering husband? <laughs> so, so it's fascinating how there's, you know, there's all these different entry levels, all these different ways you can come into fungi. But as I mentioned, in Europe, when I first went there, I noticed, I went down to the local mycological society and I passed one of the doyens of the group of mushroom. And the first thing he did, it went straight to his nose. He wanted to identify it through smell, not just through the, the features he could see. And then he's running his fingers over it and feeling the textures of it and using all of the senses to work out what it was. And so among the fungi that have some of the most amazing scents and odors of all are the truffle fungi. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the diamond of the kitchen, the black perigo truffle, tuber melanosporum. That's the one that's also farmed here in Australia, but it's an introduced species from Europe. And over the years in my workshops and forays, I ask people, what is the smell of this fungus? And I'm sure you'll realise that a truffle is what was once, in evolutionary history, a cap and stalk style umbrella-shaped mushroom that over evolutionary time has stayed within the subterrain. And the reason we think they do this is to avoid the vagaries of our very desiccating, drying climate and to stay in the subterrain where you've got more consistent moisture and temperature. 
But, you know, you can imagine Australia, a mushroom comes up and it goes, great, you know, it's 44 degrees, there's a hot, dry wind, you know, not a great place to be a mushroom. But by staying in the subterrain, you've got this issue that you can't rely on wind to disperse your spores. And that's why truffles have developed these amazing odours. And we know a lot about 40 species of our mammals, things like betongs and wallabies, vascigals, they all hunt truffles through smell. We also know some homo sapiens do as well. Some Aboriginal people have hunted truffles for thousands and thousands of years, particularly desert truffles, but most of us don't have this finely tuned sense of smell. We've lost a lot of that olfactory vocabulary to actually explain what that smell is. I mean, it's not often in life today that we really need our sense of smell in the same way as we need our sense of, of vision and hearing. Although if your house is burning down, it's a good thing we can smell, of course, but mostly we, we rely on vision and hearing. You see very few people in the supermarket actually scratching that mango to see the, you know, if you can get through the layers of plastic. But even at the market, very few people use smell. But they do a lot more, I've noticed, in Europe. And so often at workshops, I say to people, have you, have you eaten a perigo truffle? Perhaps someone shaved some on your risotto when you were in Italy or here in Melbourne. But what is that smell? And people always struggle to explain, to actually give a word to that smell. So I'll just give you a few ideas. People often say, it's earthy. And, of course, it's living in the earth, it's going to have an earthy smell. That's a fairly common response. Others have said to me, there's a bit of a nutty smell about perigo truffles. It's, it's interesting, when you watch people explaining this, when they're thinking of that smell, they always look up like this. I always think, is it just written up there somewhere? <laughs> like, people always look up to try and remember that smell. Others say it's musky. And I thought, that's interesting, because musk is a really interesting scent. I mean, this word musk originally came from the smell of a, of a male deer, although these days most musks are synthetic, but it's a very particular scent. Somebody else said they're unwashed socksish, which I thought was a, an interesting description. And about a, few, about a month ago, I left Europe and left Switzerland. When I returned, at that point when I left, the truffles were at the market for about 6,000 Swiss francs a kilo. So that's close to 10,000 Aussie dollars a kilo. I was kind of curious why as a species we pay that much for something that smells unwashed socksish, but we are an interesting species. Someone else said like overripe olives, and I thought, wow, I, I don't think I know what that smell is. I've never smelt an overripe olive, but I was fascinated that they pinpointed something so specific. Somebody else said they're a bit rancid. Again, I thought, why do we pay for something that's rancid? Somebody else said, like an old, wet Labrador that's been swimming in the dam and then put in the back of the car with the windows up. Again, not, not a very enticing smell. Someone else said, like rotting strawberries. And I thought, that's interesting because there's a, a sort of sickly sweetness to an overripe strawberry. Like my son's or my teenage son's bedroom. I thought, I don't need to know any more about that. Uh, then somebody else said, like damp tea towels. So, very specific descriptions, but always an analogy to someone else. And then there's one guy who's just listening to everyone talking, and he hesitated. Oh, we haven't got to him yet. He was in a minute. Somebody else said, like, train stations. And I thought, train stations? Like, do they mean that sort of the hot compressor smell, or do they mean that, you know, urine-soaked end of the train station? I thought, that, that's interesting. But the other guy I mentioned, he, he looked up and he said, they smell like a cross between sex and death. And I thought that was a, a brilliant description because he was alluding to that hormone-like pheromonal smell of truffles that the wallabies and fascigals are in Europe, the pigs are all, all smelling, but also that putrefying, that rotting smell. And I just thought that was the most brilliant description. And I said to him, oh, would you mind if I, if I stole that, if I use that as a title of a seminar? And I've used it before, actually. I was up in Orange in New South Wales, so I used that as the title, Between Sex and Death. I didn't actually mention it had anything to do with fungi. I packed out the auditorium. They didn't have a clue. I thought, if I had to put comma and beer, I could have even had more people. So, but it's interesting. Unlike our flora and fauna that have been... You know, in Australia, most of our ideas about what that thing out the window, whatever you want to call it, nature, the environment, biodiversity, most of our concepts about that 
have been really to do with flora and fauna. And that third F, the forgotten F, have largely been left out. So I've been thrilled in the last, last decade, but really the last three or four years, to see this, what I call a fungal awakening. We're in something of a fungal moment. And there's so many people who are coming to fungi from all those ways I mentioned before. But even historically, there's been few poets or writers who've ever written positively about fungi, particularly those in the 19th century, going back to Keats and, and Tennyson. And there's a great quote from Arthur Conan Doyle. He had this very fraught association be between fungi and disease in his novel, Sir Nigel. And this is what he had to say about those beautiful mushrooms that we all love. He said, the fields were spotted with monstrous fungi of a size and color never matched before, scarlet and mauve and liver and black. It was though the sick earth had burst into foul pustules, mildew and lichen mottled the walls, and with that filthy crop, death sprang also from the water-soaked earth. So you can see these writers didn't do fungi too many favors, and particularly in the press. Look at this, the Age newspaper, supposedly a broad, broadsheet you know, newspaper, potential killers stalk Victoria's fields. They're writing about mushrooms. I love this next one. Killer mushrooms invade picnic spots. Can you just imagine you've thrown out your picnic rug, you've got out your sandwich, opened the wine, and in come those invasive killer mushrooms. Wild fungi death trap. I took these off Trove. Some of you might know our national repository of all of our press. It's all been digitalized there. And you just put in the word fungi. This, these are the sorts of headlines you come up with. Poisonous mushrooms claim victims by the hundred. This actually refers to uh, botulism in canned mushrooms elsewhere in the world, not in Australia. And then this one, beware the killer mushrooms from the Stonington leader. So you can see why we might be a little bit mycophobic with this sort of press about fungi. However, there's plenty of people out there who are recognizing that they're not as invasive and as worrying or as deadly or as frightening. Underground lovelies, don't overlook the beauty of the mushroom, the enchanted wood, autumn glory, the fantastic fungus. So I think we are really shedding our old coat of mycophobia, opening our minds up in many, many ways. And it's so wonderful that this conference has a lot of focus on psychedelic fungi as well and the amazing benefits we can all gain from them. But I'm going to leave Martin and others to, to talk on that specialised area and go back to truffles again for a moment. So I mentioned the Perigo truffle before, and that's the one, as I was saying, people are commercially producing here. But in Australia, we probably have two to three times, we don't actually know the number, but certainly many, many more species of truffles than all the European countries combined. So here's some of the Australian truffles here that I've put in cross-section. Pretty much every eucalypt out there, you'll find truffles underneath them. It's just not really in our consciousness. We don't have those traditions of foraging, as you see the Europeans for truffles. Here's another one of our native Australian truffles, and you can see that tiny little bit of white liquid there. And some of you might be familiar with the, the cousin of this species, Lactarius deliciosus, or the saffron milk cap, a very popular edible species in Australia, very common in the Pinus radiata plantations. And you can see also with this one, the orange milk, which is one of the, or latex, one of the very important identifying features. But there's all kinds of other lactarias as well. They produce different color milk. You can see with this one where I run my fingernail over it there. You can see the, the milk exuding. Some of them, they oxidize. Once they've been bruised, you can see this particular species, a European one, is oxidizing purple. But back to the truffles again. I've been working recently up in the Murray, up in the Barma Forest on Dungala, as it's known to the Yorta Yorta people up there, on a new project with four of the aunties, the elders up there, who are looking to try and retrieve Yorta Yorta knowledge of fungi. And I was up, actually there in July, it was pretty dry, it was before we had all those amazing rains. And we were scratching around looking for truffles in the, in the soil up there on the floodplain. And one of the ways we differentiate them from a puffball is you can see this very convoluted texture. You can see that amazing brain-like texture in there. And sometimes when we cut them open, you even see these sort of veins in there. And what we're seeing, you can see it better in this next slide, you can see that vein. What we're seeing there is actually a vestigial stipe or stem. As I mentioned, a mushroom, a truffle was once a cap and stalk style mushroom that's got rid of its stipe, its stem, and got rid of its lamellae because it's not needing to disperse spores to the wind. But sometimes you see there's ones that are almost at this transitional phase between an umbrella-shaped mushroom 
and a fully developed truffle under the soil. So an amazing diversity of truffles, over 40 species of, of mammals rely on them. And I think it was Teresa Lebel, who some of you will know, our wonderful mycologist who specialises in truffles, now at the Adelaide Herbarium. And I think it was one of Teresa's students, or Teresa herself, who took a scat from a wallaby or a potteroo, a dropping, put it under the microscope, and there was literally dozens of different truffle species in one single scat. So they're, they're pretty good at, at hunting out our truffles. But it's not just truffles that are remarkably diverse in Australia. We've got, over, we think, over 1,000 species, possibly two to 3,000. But that diversity is cross, across the whole fungal kingdom. And you can see some of those umbrella-shaped mushrooms here, but also other forms, such as jellies, and puffballs, and corals, and bracket fungi, and lichens. So things to remember, it's really interesting in Europe, I was on a foray once with a young French guy and he said to me, what have you got mushrooms in Australia? He said it in a beautiful French accent. And, and I thought, wow, what is it? What is this place called Australia that he imagines that there aren't fungi? And I really wanted to say, we've got loads more than you do here in France. But of course, I didn't say that, but of course, they know their fungi very, very well. The first mycological society in the world was in Paris. And of the whole entire French population just about gets out into the, the forest in autumn looking for fungi. But Australia has this incredible diversity. We're one of 17 countries in the world that is considered to be mega diverse. So other countries such as North America, Mexico, Indonesia, Peru, Ecuador, all those countries collectively constitute 80% of the world's biodiversity. And we don't really know how many species we've got fungi in Australia. We're only really just starting to tap into that amazing diversity. Now that we have all these molecular methods to look at their DNA, we can get a much better impression of what's out there. But it's still really in its infancy relative to botany. Thing to remember, when we saw all these beautiful different forms of mushrooms, what we're seeing here is what we just call the, the sporophore or sporing body, sometimes called fruit body. I prefer sporing body because they're, they're not fruit. And what we're seeing is just the reproductive structure. So the equivalent of the flower in plants or the, the genitalia in animals, the actual fungus organism itself exists as this amazing matrix of these long cells called hyphae that fuse and branch and form the fungus mycelium. I'm sure you've all seen this when you've scratched around in the leaf litter. You've seen this cobweb-like tapestry under there. And this mycelium puts these incredible scaffolds or architecture in the soil. It holds the soil particles apart, allows the soil to become aerated. And then, of course, it can become inhabited by other organisms, such as those spineless things called invertebrates that can live in those gaps and spaces in the soil. It also stops the soil from waterlogging, allowing the water to very gently trickle down to those deeper horizons. And also, many of you may have read the book by Peter Volleb and The Secret Life of Plants or Suzanne Simard's book, Finding the Mother Tree, or some of these other popular science books on fungi that have come out recently that talk a lot about their relationships, their symbioses, or mycorrhizas, myco meaning fungus, rhiza meaning plant with trees. I'm sure you're very familiar with this. And every single tree I can see out the window, I can see some eucalypts, I can see some broadleaf European trees, there's a birch there, pretty much Almost all of our trees, most of our grasses, most of our shrubs, certainly every orchid, form these relationships, these mycorrhizal symbioses with trees. And you can see in this next slide, what you're actually looking at here is the plant root and the fungal hyphae or the mycelium attached to the root. And what they do, the fungi latch on to the root system of the tree and they expand it out, they stretch it out, massively increasing that absorbable area of the tree's root system. And that allows it to access all those interstitial spaces between the particles of dirt and sand, access water, access nutrients, and transport those back to the plant. And in return, the plant gives the fungus the lovely feed of sugars that it produces through photosynthesis. So it's a two-way, mutually beneficial relationship. And this, I think this notion of the wood wide web, of this interconnectivity of plants and fungi has been I think one of the most important discoveries in science ever in that it's really changed the way we think about forests, we think about ecosystems. Rather than thinking of them as individual entities, unrelated, unconnected in any way, when we walk into a garden or a wetland or a forest or a woodland and we recognise that whatever happens to this tree could have implications for others, I think it changes our thinking in the whole way we, we regard a forest. And 
It's interesting, I sometimes do a little demonstration with using a, a piece of vacuum, vacuum cleaner pipe and an entanglement of pantyhose. And the, the vacuum cleaner pipe represents the tree root and this entanglement of pantyhose, the mycelium. And it's a nice way to demonstrate in the forest these relationships between trees and fungi. And I've done this with a group of four-year-olds or three-year-olds, little people this big, however, however old you are when you're that tall, in France once. And um, my friend who runs a creche said, can you come and do this demonstration and talk about mycorrhizal symbioses and mycelium and fungi? I said, what, to three-year-olds? And she said, yeah, of course, they'll get it. Now, she said, bring your pantyhose, they'll love it. And basically I had this, this vacuum cleaner pipe and I said, this is the tree and this is the fungus mycelium and you all have to be a tree and connect up through this mycelium. So each child grabs an end of the stockings and they represent a tree. Anyway, of course, I have 16 stocking ends and 17 children. So suddenly there's this thing having a, a fit of hysteria, screaming at me in French in tears because she didn't get to hold one end of the stocking. So I took off my hard hat and I said, you've got the really important job here. I popped the hard hat on her head, I said, you've got to work out which of these trees to cut down. You're the forester. You have to cut one of these trees down. The whole point was, you know, I'm trying to explain that when we remove one tree, there's implications for other plants because they're connected by this wood wide web. Well, it took her about one millisecond and she eyes off this little guy and she makes a beeline to him, does a rugby taffle, tackle and throws him to the ground. And because all the kids are pulling on this stocking, there's all this tension on it, he goes down all of the others go down. And they got it like that. I mean, I'm not saying that if you cut one tree down in a forest, that all of the other trees fall down, because all the trees got back up and started punching each other. So, but I'm saying that there are implications. What we do to one tree has reverberations for others. So I think we're starting to think much more holistically about horticulture, about gardening, about forestry, about how we think about ecosystems. So I think it's a, a very, very exciting time. Just to take you for a quick whiz through some of our more charismatic or significant species, I always love this handsome beast, Aceroa rubra. This was the first fungus to ever be described in Australia in 1792 by Jacques Labiadier, the French naturalist who is on the Dontrecasto expedition in southern Tasmania. What's ironic is this, its natural habitat is really is more alpine, but it turns up very commonly in wood chips in gardens. Perhaps you've seen something like this in your own garden. I'm seeing a few nods there. The thing that's really fascinating, if you go online and you put in Aceroa rubra or the anemone stinkhorn, most of the information about it is how to destroy it. It's the panic that people have when this thing comes up in their garden and unfolds its tentacles. And it has this amazing scent, just like carrion. You can see those little black bits on the arms there. That's the spore mass. And it deliberately, deliberately produces this scent, of course, to attract flying vectors, flies, and other organisms that dance around in it and zoom off and spread their spores. And so it's interesting. I've seen on this blog, you can throw bleach on it. You can hit it with the whippersnipper. You can throw boiling water on it which is quite incredible because what it's actually doing is breaking down that organic matter in the garden, recycling those wood chips or whatever else is there, releasing the nutrients, making them available to the other plants. But I think, I think we're changing. I think we're slowly starting to, to realise how much they matter. Another species that's a really interesting one in Australia, some of you might have seen something like this one. Looks a little bit perhaps like an oyster mushroom. Have you ever had oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus ostriatus? from the supermarket or the market, or maybe you've grown your own. Looks a little bit like that. In fact, the name of this one once was also Pleurotus. It's now changed to something called Omphalotus, Omphalotus nidiformis. If you come back at night, it looks like this. And this is our, our largest and one of our very few bioluminescent fungi in Australia. And it can, contains a compound called Illudin. And unlike the oyster mushroom, if you confuse this one and consume it, it has a very, Illudin is a very powerful emetic, so it's going to come back out again very violently. And so it's, um, it's one not to mix up. It's one that causes a lot of, well, not a lot, but it causes some poisonings in Victoria each autumn. And there are records in early settlers' diaries of Aboriginal people being very aware of this fungus, but not particularly being too keen on it. There's, there's some records in diaries of, of some drovers not wanting to camp near these because they believed, the Aboriginal people believed that they were the spirit ancestors and to give them their space. So uh, very, very interesting species. You know, in South Australia, in Mount Gambier, 
Forestry South Australia have developed what I think is the first example of mycotourism there. And in one of their pine plantations, they now call it Ghost Mushroom Lane. And you can go there, you know, it's suitably spookier at night. And they've, in the last five years, they've had 70,000 people come through to see the ghost mushrooms and all these children coming through. Very, I mean, I think probably for them, it's got more to do with the ghost bit than the mushroom bit, but it's still a fantastic way of actually getting them interested. So a few other species. I'm, my main interest in, in fungi is in, is in their conservation and biodiversity conservation generally. And as I mentioned before, when we've got these connectivities between those mammals that eat the fungi and the trees and the fungi that form these relationships, we've got these three kingdoms so tightly interwoven, you can't really think about biodiversity conservation and leave an entire kingdom out. But what I've noticed at workshops and over the years of working professionally in photography is that as humans, we tend to very much respond to those charismatic aesthetic species. And I'm really interested in this intersection where science or ecology, mycology, conservation and aesthetics come together. I think this is a, a really interesting place and it's not always easy because sometimes the species that we're drawn to that are aesthetic aren't necessarily ones that have so much ecological function or perhaps might even be an invasive species. So there's some really interesting tensions to negotiate there. But a few years ago, I did a little bit of a survey in Victoria, central Victoria, and I had a dozen very beautiful different fungi, and I showed it to 50, 60 different people and asked them to nominate which one they would suggest would be a flagship species. You might know this concept of a flagship, a species that represents a particular group of organisms or an environment or an environmental issue. And this one, the pixies parasol, or my cedar interrupter, half of the people who contributed said this was the most charismatic species they've ever seen. A close contender was its cousin, Caranta mycena, Vicidio Caranta, or the ruby bonnet. These things you can see, it's on an acacia leaf there. They're literally just a few millimetres high, very, very endearing things. But the fungi that probably worldwide have been the most effective flagships are known as the wax caps. And particularly in Europe, in the UK, elsewhere in continental Europe, they're seen as being indicators of unimproved, this word is bizarre, unimproved grasslands. Unimproved means ones that haven't been trashed. <laughs> so they haven't actually been irrigated or compacted or had a lot of fertiliser to apply. So these will only grow in areas where there's low levels of nitrogen from nitrogen fertilisers that haven't actually been too trampled. And in Australia, we have had one of the few reserves in the world set aside for an endangered community of wax caps. In fact, one of them in that community, I want to the name it, I want you to guess where that community might be, where this reserve has been set aside. I think there's only about a dozen reserves in the world that have been set aside to protect fungi. Does anyone know where ours in Australia is? I know that you're going to know, Dave. <laughs> anyone else know? Okay, David. Exactly. It's right in suburban Sydney. In fact, the fungus is called Hygrocybe Lane Covensis. It's right in Lane Cove, and it just blows me away. Right in the middle of this, you know, very intensive housing, you've got this little bushland reserve with this endangered community of wax caps. Although now we realise it's always hard to know if something's endangered or if it's just under-surveyed, whether no one's actually been out there looking. So we've since found that they do grow in a few more, few more places, but we won't tell anybody else about that. We'll still keep the reserve. Another species of interest is uh, the beech orange, or Soteria gunnii, which was one, again, eaten by Tas Tasmanian Aboriginal people and various others, only grows in association with Nothophagus. And many of the threats for our fungi that are perhaps rare are to do with threats to their habitat. So Nothophagus habitat is, is fairly limited in Australia. We don't have a look, bit in the Otways, bit in Tasmania, tiny little bit in Victoria. So um, something to think about with fungi is that the threats to their habitat. I'm sure none of you will recognise these little brown mushrooms in the audience. I couldn't quite work out what they are, but I'm sure there's some speakers who will help us. Also a very charismatic species. But then we come to this issue that I mentioned of when we have a species that's exceedingly beautiful but also considered invasive. And these terms are a little, you know, these terms of, you know, whether something is native or indigenous or naturalised or introduced or invasive, they're all very arbitrary. They've become, those terms aren't that defined. There's a lot of overlap in these terms these days. But this little one, some of you might have seen this around. This is known as the orange 
ping pong bat or Favalachia chlordopus, or for a long time it was called Calicera, so if you look online it's still got the old name. And this was, we think this may have come from Madagascar, it's not really known, it's always hard to track where something comes from. It might have come via New Zealand in, in, packet, in pellets, wooden pellets to Australia. We're not really sure where it came from, how it got here. I first saw it in 2012 in Wilson's Promontory. I think the first record was about 2004 in suburban Melbourne. But what's incredible, in that time, it has just spread incredibly. Here's a, a map of part of Melbourne, and you can see all the places where it's been recorded. And it's typically found in what we call ruderal environments. They're environments that have been disturbed by, by humans. So places like picnic grounds, walking tracks, car parks, campgrounds, golf courses, those sorts of places. And why the species is a little bit of a concern, and getting mycologists a bit worried, is that it lives in wood, lives on old logs and sticks. The fungus is actually within the wood, breaking it down. But it secretes an antifungal compound. And so potentially it could ward off other fungi that also live within that wood. It seems that the antifungal it secretes is not particularly strong. It's quite, quite a weak antifungal. But when we look at but when we look at how much it's spread, obviously it's having no trouble at all colonising, perhaps displacing those native fungi. So there's a whole lot of PhD projects here waiting to happen for researchers to try and work out what on earth is going on. Another fungus that is starting to be considered as problematic is perhaps the most revered species in the world, also a psychedelic species. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the classic fly garrick, Amanita muscaria. That's another introduced species. It probably came in with early forestry in Australia, along with the saffron milk cap that I mentioned earlier. And I think of all the fungi in the world, this is probably the most spoken about, the most illustrated. I mean, there's books, there's a book in Sweden that I've come across that's just about this one fungus species. Unfortunately, it's all in Swedish, so I can't read it particularly well, but it's, I think it's captured the imaginations of people across the world throughout history because it is psychedelic, it's also toxic, and it's incredibly handsome and charismatic, and it's always, you know, those fairies underneath it and all those pictures. I think probably if you give someone a box of pencils and you ask them to draw a mushroom, it's pretty much this one that they'll draw. However, when it was introduced to Australia, it was, whether it was accidental or we're not sure, it was associated with pine trees. What was then Pinus insignis, now Pinus radiata. It also grows with birches and other broadleaf trees such as oak. But in the last couple of decades, this fungus has looked out of its pine plantation and said, down in the Otways, it said, oh, quite like those native beech, those Nopophagus trees, and it's moved out of the pine forest, latched onto the roots, of the native beech trees and probably displaced the, the native fungi that are on the beech trees. And so what, what are the implications of that? When an introduced fungus can displace the native fungi that are really important to that beech, it could potentially weaken the resilience of those trees. So there's some researchers in New Zealand, because it's also done the same thing in New Zealand, Victoria and Tasmania. And there's some researchers there trying to look at what are the implications for our native Nothophagus forests with this fungus having moved in and potentially knocking out the fungi that form those relationships? So there's, there's all these yeah, incredible research projects that we need to do. We need to get bright young mycologists there studying these. And I was thinking about you know, how fungi have, have, have really not been on the agenda, at, at, mostly at, at, at national level, if you look at our national biodiversity strategy, fungi weren't even included until very recently. This is a strategy we have to produce as being part of the requirement of being a signatory of the Kyoto Protocol. And so I had a bit of a, a mess around with our, our coat of arms, and I was just wanted to know what you think about this, this new arrangement. What do you think? <laughs> a morel and a stinkhorn. Do you think I should give Anthony a ring and see what he reckons? Anyway. I really appreciate your attention and I'll, I'll wind it up there, but I'd love to hear if you've got any stories you want to tell or comments or questions or queries, and I really appreciate you all being here today and I wish you the most wonderful conference. <laughs> any questions at all? We're all ready for coffee. That's easy then. I can go and get the coffee. Thanks so much, everyone. Uh, Alison, I have <laughs> one, one more question. You're not going to get away so easily. Yes. Um, 
what actions do you, uh, can we take to remediate and maintain fungal diversity? Oh, wonderful question. So restoring fungi, it's, it's not like restoring vegetation where you, you dig a hole, you pop the seedling in, you put, some, put a tree guard around it, you water it and watch it grow. It's hard to, to re-fungus in that same way that we replant something. But there's two things we can do that I think will encourage fungi to colonise. And the first one is to minimise the stresses that fungi don't like. So if you're using chemicals, if you're using fire, if you're driving heavy machinery across your property or through your garden, think about how many chemicals, how much fire, how much compaction, don't overwater. All these things will reduce the fungal diversity. But the big one is removing organic matter. Don't chip. Because when you chip, you, you reduce the wood to a one centimetre square. Not all fungi want to live on that. Some want to live on an old stick or a young stick or a log or a piece of bark. The more diversity you can encourage in your garden, the more organic matter of different shapes, sizes, species and age, the more different habitats you provide for those fungi to colonise. Fungal spores are ubiquitous. They're everywhere. They'll be there all the time. What they're looking for is the right conditions. If that particular fungus needs old bark, but there's no old bark in your garden, you won't get that species. And the more diversity of fungi you have, different fungi do different things in the garden. The more diversity of fungi, the more resilient and the more robust and the more drought-proof and the more resilient your garden is to the effects of climate change. So one, reduce the stresses. So chemical use, fire, compaction, overwatering, and try and maximise the diversity of organic matter. Resist that temptation to rake or blow it away. Try and keep that organic matter there. And you'll actually keep more moisture in the garden, make it less prone to fire, and encourage more diversity of fungi, which will improve the health of all your plants. So I hope that gives you a bit of an overview. So, yes? Sure, so in a function ecosystem, the concept of disease doesn't really exist. Like a fungus doesn't usually. It's very rare for a fungus to get completely out of control. And I don't want to say balanced ecosystem because that concept's sort of out outdated now. But usually what a fungal attack is, whether it's spots on the roses or potato blight or phytophthora on a fungus, but say armillaria or something like that, it's usually not a cause, but a symptom of poor management. So when we remove all that organic matter, when we rake everything up, what happens is we take away all those fungi that keep the system in check and allow one to flourish. So the, the very classic one is armillaria or the honey fungus that can actually wipe out a huge amount of trees, very, very, they say, you know, aggressive fungus. But if we actually keep all that organic matter there and keep the other fungi there, they're competing with it for resources. So oftentimes, when there's an outbreak, it's because we've created a monoculture. Or we've removed the other fungi through removing the organic matter. So I think we sometimes reverse it. We, we think what is a cause of a problem is actually a symptom of a much bigger problem in the way we're managing an environment and the synergy of multiple things. It might be that the forest has a, a history of intensive logging and burning, and so it's not at its best. And then we put some roading through there, and then we do something else. So I think, think about it. Maybe it, it can help just to put that other overlay in, saying, is this the cause? Is this fungus the cause of the problem here? Or is it a symptom of how this garden has been managed historically or what we're doing today? So does that help? Thank you very much for your question. Oh, is habitat enough? I mean, uh, um, there, I'm presuming what you mean, do we need to inoculate with other fungi to bring spores in? But generally speaking, I think it's really hard to bring inoculants or bring spores in when you don't know what the requirements are of the plants in the garden. In fact, in New Zealand, inoculants are being banned because for that reason that, and particularly a lot of them are coming from America. Why would fungi coming from America necessarily want to form a relationship with trees here in Australia? So I think rather than inoculating or bringing the spores or the mycelium, I mean, in some very particular situations you can do that, but I think if you create the habitat, look after that environment, keep the disturbance minimal, that should be enough. If you're working, say, with endangered orchids or something like that, where you're trying to get a mycorrhizal association established and we know exactly which fungus forms with that orchid, then certainly in that situation you might, inoculants could be very useful. But I think, generally speaking, you're probably going to waste your money by... There was a, a, an online survey uh, 
seminar recently where someone looked at a whole lot of different commercial inoculants and the great majority of them actually didn't contain any inoculant. So if you are going to go that way, make sure you know where you're getting it from. You all have a wonderful day and thanks again so much. I think the next speaker's on. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Alison, thank you so, so much for that.